My name is John Cooper and I'm a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries and in my day job I teach and research 16th century British history at the University of York which is the period of course we call the Tudors. And the manuscript that I'd like to talk to you about is in the Society of Antiquaries terms manuscript 125 which is a book of fees and offices dating from Mary I's reign. And we know that it came into the possession of the Society of Antiquaries in the 18th century. In fact, we have an exact date, the 11th of May, 1769, given by a lawyer named Daines Barrington. And it was a remarkably valuable gift because this manuscript enables us to examine in intense detail the household of Queen Mary I and all the officers who served her across the country. And the first interesting thing about this manuscript is its date. And the title page tells us that this was created on the 1st of August, 1553. Now this is only days after Mary has taken the throne from the abortive reign of Lady Jane Grey. And so this is the point at which Mary is seeking to establish control of the realm. And she's trying to work out who the officers are who serve her, both at court, but all the way across the country, and what she owes them. What what kind of fees they will be demanding, uh, what she needs to pay them. And I suspect there's another agenda here as well, which is, of course is the fact that Mary is a profoundly devoted Catholic and the previous regime has been a strongly Protestant regime. And it's possible that Mary is compiling a list of everybody who serves her in order to run through that list and see if she can get rid of any staunch Protestants in her household or out in the country who may not be as loyal to her as she wants them to be. But the most striking thing about this manuscript, as you can see, is this richly illuminated title page. And that's very interesting in itself because, of course, we associate illuminations more with sacred books. But, of course, that culture has been more or less destroyed by the Reformation introduced by Henry VIII and accelerated under Henry's son, Edward VI. Now we have a Catholic regime coming back this, of course, is not a sacred book. It's a book of state. But it's very interesting seeing the richness of the Tudor royal iconography worked into this manuscript. And if you were to look at this closely, you would see that we have imperial crowns atop a couple of the illuminated title pages. And those crowns are closed, which shows that Mary is claiming to be an empress of England. She's not just a queen, she's an empress. And the detail on these crowns is really beautiful. If you look very closely, you can see not only crosses, but fleur-de-lis worked into the crown. So these are actual representations of the crown of England. And you also see the royal arms illuminated in one of the um, initial letters of this manuscript. But underneath that set of royal arms is something very interesting and really, frankly, rather unusual. It's a pomegranate. Now, why, you might think, would there be a pomegranate? on this manuscript in the Society of Antiquaries. There's a very good reason for that. And the pomegranate was the personal symbol of Mary's mother, Catherine of Aragon. And of course, Catherine of Aragon's marriage to Henry VIII had been declared invalid, hence the break from Rome, the Reformation, and Mary had herself been declared illegitimate. But this is Mary's claim of legitimacy. And if you look at this manuscript closely, you would see that the crown and the royal arms and the pomegranate appear in perfect alignment. The fact that these three symbols, the crown, the royal arms, and the pomegranate for Catherine of Aragon appear in alignment, suggests that Mary is making a strong claim, not only for her own legitimacy, but the legitimacy of her mother, who of course Henry VIII had, had cast off as his wife. There are also a number of other details um, that are worth drawing your attention to in this manuscript. I think it's a very beautiful title page. And this is a very humble, functionary sort of book, which is interesting. But in a sense, even this humble list of all of the officers that are serving the crown, it plays its role in Tudor royal propaganda. It's part of the rich iconography of the Tudor monarchy. And so you have this rather wonderfully opulent, gold leaf encrusted border showing roses and other flowers just snaking up from the bottom to the top of this manuscript amongst this other iconography and this little date that's been added to the top, 1553, um, so that you have the date in Latin here and then the date in Arabic numerals at the top. These pages take us right into the heart of the royal household.
we have a reference here to the revels office and the master of the revels and the yeoman of the revels. Of course, the revels are responsible for all the court entertainments, the masks, the pageants, the tournaments that go on. And these do go on at Mary's court, just as they had gone on at Henry VIII's court and Edward VI's court. And here is the proof we have the revels office still functioning. But it's the next set of accounts that particularly appeal to me. It may not be politically correct these days, but all the Tudor monarchs were inveterate hunters. They loved hunting with hounds and they loved hawking. And we associate hunting with Elizabeth. We associate hunting with Henry VIII. We don't actually particularly associate hunting with Mary. But again, here is the proof to the contrary. We have references to the harriers, the heart hounds, the buck hounds, and the otter hounds. And then we have a marvellous payment here of 13 pounds and six shillings to the groom of the buck hounds for the hound's meat. So the accounting methods were so thorough in this document that even the dog's meat was put down in this manuscript, which I find very striking. And it just shows how closely governed Tudor England was. And then we move on to musicians and players. Again, because of the records that have survived, we tend to associate music more, I think, with Henry VIII's reign and more with Elizabeth's reign. But we are now beginning to understand that Queen Mary kept a significant musical establishment herself, both sacred music and music for the household. And it's music for the household, for her own entertainment, that's being described here. So we have trumpeters, luters, harp players, singers, and rebeck players and sagbut players. Now, this is the reference when I first looked at this manuscript for the first time that really excited me. So we've moved on from the musicians, the secular musicians of the Tudor court, the bagpipe players and the sackbutt players and the rebeck players, to what's called the chapel, and that's the chapel royal. That's the musicians, the singers, the organists who sing mass for the Queen, of course the Catholic mass now again into Queen Mary's reign, uh, and they staff the chapels um, both of the London palaces, uh, whether that's Greenwich or Richmond or the Palace of Westminster, but they also, the Chapel Royal, follow the Queen when she goes on progress and travel around the country. And there is a reference here to one very famous member of the Chapel Royal, and it's just here, and it's to Thomas Tallis. And of course, Tallis is one of the greatest of the Tudor composers. He survives all the way through from Henry VIII's reign through Edward VI, Mary's, and then into Elizabeth's reign, changing the tenor of his music. We know that Thomas Tallis was quite Catholic facing, but he actually manages to compromise his principles under Edward VI and compose quite Protestant looking music. But one feels he's on safer ground when he comes back to Queen Mary's reign and he's composing settings for the mass again. And here he is employed in the Chapel Royal. And of course, Thomas Tallis will go on to serve Elizabeth um, and compose the great 40 part motet Speminalium, which possibly dates from Queen Mary's reign, more likely to date from Elizabeth's reign. In fact, we don't have a precise date for that, but it really is um, the absolute height of 16th century English devotional music. And here we find this rather splendid reference to Thomas Tallis. So what does all of this add up to, you might be asking? Well, we can say that quite literally. One of the purposes of this manuscript is to tell us and tell Mary how much she owed what her outgoings were. Just anybody taking over a, a great household will want to know how much am I committed to spending on my household? How much should I pay to all of the officers of that household? And here we have the sum total of the officers and ministers of the household. And it's a lot of money. It is 16,850, 68 pounds, five shillings, one penny and a halfpenny. So literally down to the last halfpenny, these fees and offices are accounted for in this extraordinary manuscript. 